What we have you here to, to answer for us today is, is Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 canon? Uh, I, I, I think that would deprive <laughs> your viewership of a really, really Byzantine explanation that you guys could come up with on a very special episode. <laughs> I'm a big fan, and I'm very excited about this. And I do think that we should just jump right in, uh -huh. and I should immediately, because I know that I'm going to be asked, and that it's very important, and probably the single most burning question about this movie. Uh -huh. And so, exclusively for you guys, I just want to just come out and say it now. Just, just tell it like it is, and tell you <laughs> that that is Barrier Watt. And not our <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, that, so no problem there. Okay, that is that is what was as, as God intended. That was what we always uh, meant to have nice. happen on Noah. Was that was that was that legitimately discussed? <laughs> uh, you know what? You'd be surprised by what actually did come up and get discussed in terms of 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 what we were doing and how granular it got that one actually did not uh, but uh, but i've decided it now so. gotcha well Good. we can cut out the part where you said it wasn't discussed and just just <laughs> no that's what it is it's what it is it's, Absolutely. it's not arcus comic because how would it be why exactly yeah. okay well welcome back everyone that happens to be listening to this to another watchtower database exclusive interview today we have with us uh, the Watchtower Database's biggest fan Eric Carrasco, uh, who also just happens to be the writer of Just Libra's Fatal Five or, and a, the Supergirl show or something I'm not, I don't know, I didn't really look him up too much, um, but it's a pleasure to chat with you today, Eric, really whoever you are I'm so I'm so sorry for that. Uh, that was a, such a terrible. I feel I'm bad so immediately. I'm so happy to be here with such a great preamble. <laughs> you know, we talked to Sam Liu the other day. We talked to Susan for the second time, and for whatever reason, I have the highest amount of stomach butterflies talking to you. Maybe it's because I know that I'm constantly being, I don't know, judged. <laughs> First of all, legend and legend, Sam and Susan. So yes. that is a. Uh, very cool indeed that you got them because I know that when I met Susan, I was very excited. She referred to your being on the project as as if her son was writing the Justice League movie. So I hope that that's a that's a complimentary. <laughs> it, it, I'm, I'm going to take it as exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> well, before we get too much into it, um, we first wanted to just kind of ask you some general questions like how you got into the animation industry because you appear to be about our age. So we're, I guess, just wondering where we went wrong. <laughs> Why we didn't break into the animation industry. It does certainly feel like I have fan fictioned my way mm -hmm. into being paid to do what I would have been doing anyway. I feel uh, very privileged and lucky to be able to do that. One thing that's fun about this particular one is that when I was a lad and they first started doing these DTVs because that is how far back they go at yep. this point. Like that Superman Doomsday movie that came out was quite a long time ago now. Yeah. When that first came out, my brother and I wrote a fan fiction screenplay, not prose, an actual like 70 some odd page mm -hmm. script <laughs> in script format. It was a DTV that was a continuation of Justice League Unlimited it was in that universe. Uh -huh. And I don't remember the exact plot of it, but I remember that it involved Red X from the original Teen Titans <laughs> nice. show and our attempt to take him from that show and make him canon in the DCAU. <laughs> and I know that Mr. Terrific was a really prominent part of the Justice League in it. And then it had something to do with taking over like the transporters to the Watchtower or something like that. Uh -huh. But it was basically exactly what I got hired to do here. We were like nice. taking Miss Martian from Young Justice and bringing her into the DCAU yeah. and, you know, Mr. Terrific's in the Justice League. And it was just, it feels very uh, full circle in a way because I was always obsessed with these little 75 minute movies that DC puts out every once in a while. So that was very cool. Um, but how I got into like professional animation, I worked in television as an assistant uh, on Sleepy Hollow, among other things. They let me write the Sleepy Hollow comic book while I was an okay. assistant on the show, while, while I was getting lunch for people. I was introduced by my friend uh, John Callen, who is a, a Justice League action writer, among other things. And he introduced me to Jim Creek. And because I had that comic book sample, Jim was able to, you know, sort of take a chance on me and hire me 
onto a cartoon that he was show running at the time called uh, Legend Quest, which is a Netflix cartoon that you can watch that many of the writers involved in the DC universe wrote on. Uh, so I wrote on that and I was in the WB animation building a lot, which meant a lot of FaceTime with Jim and a lot of FaceTime with Alan Burnett. And mm. Alan hired me to do some of the Justice League action shorts. They were literally little two minute yeah. uh, shorts. One of mine was the Plastic Man of Steel and it was just Plastic Man and Superman and Lois and Lex on the Daily Planet rooftop. Just these little tiny things. And I guess Alan really liked these two minute shorts. A while later, he just called me directly out of the blue one day and was like, Hey, it's Alan Burnett. You know those DTV things we do? Do you, you want to do one of them? And it was as simple as that. I jumped out of my chair and was silently fist pumping and said yes. And then we were kind of off to the races. Nice. You kept it cool on the phone with the fist pumps off to the side, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, Alan, that sounds superb. I would love to do such a thing. I suppose I can make room in my schedule. Yes, exactly. Thank you for your consideration. Yes. <laughs> it might have been Jim in his ear. It might have been that I had uh, talked and pitched a bunch of ideas that were Legion of Superheroes related. That's mm -hmm. been one of my theories. You know, I know on some level, I was a relatively easy sell as a new writer to Warner Brothers because I was by that point already working on the Supergirl TV show. And so it was sort of, I was already a corporate shill at yeah. that point. So <laughs> <laughs> well, we I did want to actually ask about that sort of, uh, it's, it's come up naturally, so I might as well. Your work on the Supergirl show, there's a lot, I mean, especially last season with the Legion of Superheroes. Do you feel like that was influential on the script for Fatal Five? Because especially, you know, Brainiac Five and Saturn Girl play prominent roles, and then mon -El makes his first DCAU appearance and that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm actually, um, I don't know. I'm thinking back to my first, first draft of the script and wondering if mon -El was actually in there. I keep joking mm -hmm. about, because he's silent in that whole Legion fight scene, I keep uh, uh, thinking I should go get Chris Wood, yeah. the, the <laughs> Monel on Supergirl, to come and just like record a bunch of Grunts. dialogue for that so we can just lay it <laughs> over. I think that would be fun. It wasn't direct. So I was actually one of the people along with uh, a co-writer, Derek Simon, who got to write the Legion of Superheroes episode for Supergirl. So I felt very lucky to, got, to get to like introduce Brainiac 5 to that world. I think every time I'm writing Brainy, there is an element of the Supergirl version, the Jesse Rath version of Brainiac 5 that just sort of naturally comes out in the writing because mm -hmm. that's how I hear him and how I think of him. This, a little bit of that, but I think Noel Fisher brings something, you know, really great to the role that is different than what Jesse Rath is doing. Yeah. And I think mostly what I was drawing on with Brainy was the the Far From Home episode that sure. he's in where he's played by Matt Sucre. The, the biggest thing it helped me with was I had already sort of done my research. When they said this is going to be Justice League versus the Fatal Five, I had a gigantic stack of Legion of Superheroes comics mm -hmm. that I had gotten for research for Supergirl. And I had oh, I was already familiar with the Fatal Five, both because of the cartoon, but also because of a ton of comics that I had just read to be able to write these Supergirl episodes. And so I came in with kind of a head start. We had to write this so quickly that it was helpful to already have a base knowledge of the Legion, the Fatal Five, and have those, those facts and runs and stuff right at the tip of my tongue, ready to go. Brainiac 5, we've seen him a couple of different times in DCAU. First in um, <laughs> New Kids um, in Town, he had a little cameo, and he had this long, luscious mullet. And then in Far From mm -hmm. Home, he's got like short blonde hair, and now he's totally bald. So it's there's he's been Lex this... Luthor. That's my he's question. <laughs> Is he related? Do you think he's related to Luthor from the Justice League Unlimited story arc with Cadmus? I really <laughs> like, I really like that theory. That's my head cannon. Uh, That's my. I, think, yeah. I, I, what I want to do is create one special mini episode with Brainy where he has a different hairstyle and sandwich it in a place that makes it Nightwing's mullet difficult to explain. Yeah. Um, just give you one of those real quick. Um, I, I think thank you. style choice. I think Brainiac has seen some stuff and has decided to shave his head because he's seen things That's that the easy answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't know how Lex Luthor went bald in this universe. It happened when he stole all those cakes. 
That's true. That was that's true. Forty of them. That's a lot of cakes. Very nearly a Justice League action episode. Oh really? Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of classic Legion of Superheroes, classic like '80s, '90s DC stuff. That's definitely it. Feels that way in the movie, which I think is great because I think that helps kind of bring in or keep the nostalgic like feeling of that era of DC cartoons. Um, because they were always drawing from, you know, pre, obviously pre New 52 era stuff. Yeah, it's fun. It almost went the other direction, by the way. Uh-huh. Like I, once I had worked on this movie, I then would try to here and there sneak stuff into Supergirl from it. So <laughs> oh, nice. Susan Eisenberg is actually the voice of the uh, Legion Museum tour oh, uh, okay. that you hear when they're, when they're walking through and they see the Justice League statues and, and all that stuff. And that dialogue... Uh, talking about the the post scarcity utopia yeah. ushered in by uh-huh. the Legion of Superheroes, that stuff I tried to put into the Legion of Superheroes episode. There was supposed to be a part where they walked through the ship and heard like a fragment of that. <laughs> just, That's cool. just, just as a little sneaky, but it did. It ended up getting cut. So. Well, I know you didn't have room for Supergirl in the in the story, as you uh, as your um, now famous tweet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the immortal tweet, right? Yeah, well, one of several we <laughs> we ended up using, <laughs> uh, but, and that makes sense. I mean, it, it, the obvious, like I think we're all on the same uh, understanding of you know, tell the story. The other stuff is kind of you know. Sp- extra sauce special sauce you can sprinkle on top um i don't know if you sprinkle sauce but you know what i'm no. saying but did, <laughs> but did you I th- have I, th- I think it's more of a pouring <laughs> or, or a cherry it could just a, be a cherry a, a dab Whatever. of you, you pour it onto a napkin first, and then you dab that the napkin yes. onto the to transfer the sauce. That's exactly. what kind of heathen are you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, was there was there ever a desire to include her because you work with Supergirl on set every week, or is there was that never really part of the? I mean, once you made the oh jump, my god, yes, uh, I almost put her on the Justice League team. Ultimately, I decided against it before I ever even pitched anything to Jim or Alan or Bruce. Because because of the Justice League Unlimited episode, mm-hmm. Far From Home, because even before this project was like definitively uh, an extension of Justice League, like before <laughs> any of that, it already was in my head canon. And so, you know, I did this when pitching ideas for Justice League Action too. You get in there, and you're like, oh, I get to work with these characters. And the animation style, it's, it's pretty close to Bruce Timm's style, the Shane Gorin style yeah. in Justice League action. And you got Kevin Conroy as Batman. So you find yourself when pitching ideas, and I, I know a few of us younger writers had this experience, you find yourself trying to sneak in little references to the episodes, a little bit of little iceberg lounge here, mm-hmm. and a little, like, finding ways to bring in that DCAU continuity, because we're all such fans of it, before we even knew what style this was going to be in or that we were going to get the, the voice acting trinity back before any of that, I was already like, well, I want this to fit in in my head just in case so that I can personally headcanon this. And so, you know, rewatched Far From Home, looked at that for Our Fatal Five, and we made some changes, we made some updates, but Supergirl, putting her on the Justice League roster was going to really complicate the timeline and when this had to take place, and I just wanted to to not get into that. And then, you know, again, I do get to write her every week on the show. Right. Yeah, yeah. So there was a bit of, well, it is my chance to like touch on some other characters. So it was a bit of both, but did really consider putting her on the actual Justice League roster. It just felt like you had Superman there already. It's a lot of the same power set. If mm-hmm. you've got her on the team, as much as this is a continuity continuation of the show, it would be very confusing for someone yeah. who is just wanting to watch this one movie mm-hmm. to suddenly see the future and in that flash forward in Starboy's brain, Supergirl's flying around in there, you would for a moment be taken out of it just going, wait, how the hell yeah. did she get there? <laughs> the idea in my head was at least if she's not seen at all, she can just be off screen in the future right. if you want her to be. Sure. <laughs> um, and that was always kind of what we set out to do before, before any of the rest of us decided yeah, a lot of the reason why our Will It Cannon video became as long as it was and how we're, you know, we're starting to be more, um, I guess, overly in-depth than we even started being, which is hard to imagine, I guess. Um, <laughs> when, when something comes up as an issue or whatever, 
I try to like address, oh, well, it could be this or it could be this. I really don't care where Supergirl is. Like, I know that she's either there or she isn't at this point, and it doesn't really matter because it doesn't affect the story. But I know there's going to be 5,000 people that go, oh, but, the, uh, but where is she? Oh, my God. And so I have to talk about it or else there's no. No, you do. And I, I, for me, that's always been, I mean, you talk about this a lot in the video, but. That's always been what these shows are like. Kyle Rayner is there and then he's not. And then you yeah. see that he's on Noah and you're mm-hmm. like, okay, that's where he's been. Part of me can never be annoyed about people <laughs> geeking out about this stuff yeah. because it's just what I do. It's right. fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. it, it, I do it from a place of love and positivity. So, so I, sometimes I see like people who just want to tear it down and kind of assume there's plot holes just because not every ounce of something was explained and perhaps not realizing that it would be so boring to watch if everything were just endlessly yep. explained. Yep. Yep. But if it's coming from a place of positivity, especially I love it. Like I want people to have these debates. I think it's neat. Um, <laughs> yeah. Definitely. It's healthy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also like, you know, uh, bouncing boy is not in the future either. And he was a big part of that episode. So it's like, okay, yeah. where's, <laughs> where's bouncing not boy? canon. He was in the museum. Hashtag <laughs> bears Bouncing boy. Bouncing boy. Supergirl. That's what I'm saying. Well, the, the film also heavily highlights the subject of mental health in both of the main characters, Green Lantern, Jessica Cruz, and Starboy. Um, so what, what inspired you to tackle those subjects in the script? It started from simply loving Jessica Cruz as a character and loving Tom Cowher as a character. All I knew going in was that this was going to be Justice League up against the Fatal Five. And there were a lot mm-hmm. of technical reasons and animation reasons and excitement and marketing reasons that went into that decision. But once that's the writing prompt and you know that it's that, that means probably the fatal five are going to come back in time to fight the justice league or vice versa. You know that the Legion has to be in there somewhere. Mm-hmm. And my favorite Legionnaire is Starboy. So I love him in the Legion of superheroes comics. And I particularly love the comics uh, where he comes back in time yeah. and doesn't have the medication that he needs because of our inferior 21st century medicine. The JSA issues by, by Jeff Johns. And right, it's wonderful. Right, exactly. and he's wonderful in it. And so that was kind of the take we were pulling from on Starboy because I felt like he is the perfect messenger to come back in time and herald this and tell us these, these very bad people are coming to do very bad things. And when I was picking the Justice League roster, my favorite Green Lantern is Jessica Cruz. She's a new one, but she's instantly become a favorite of mine. And we looked at Starboy, who we knew that we wanted to use, and just realized, oh, Jessica and Starboy should be the main characters of this. They have information and a story that can help the other. And that mm-hmm. was actually the piece that clicked into place that made the whole movie work. They both have mental health issues. And so we were able to kind of dig into that in, I, I think, a, a very uh, honest way. Obviously, everybody's experience with it is different. You might have something. You might know someone that has something. And so we never wanted to, like, fully diagnose them or just... Yeah, label put them a number. And, and yeah, exactly. leave them. Yeah. We want you to be able to watch it and kind of bring a piece of yourself to the characters and, and imprint on them and, and relate to them in, in whatever way you see fit because, you know, we all have our stuff and we all have our challenges. And so there, there was a, a decision that once you're doing those two characters and you've committed to that, you should get it right. And it became like a theme that informed the whole movie because you, just to be true to the comics, wanted to at some point see Starboy in a mental hospital. But obviously the one that's the most interesting in our universe and the most famous is Arkham. So Mm. if you put him there, you want to see an Arkham that is working or at least trying to work where people Mm -hmm. that you recognize, uh, Two-Face in this case, which I was very excited about, (laughs) um, are actually making progress (laughs) and like, like doing the work. Two Face is one of my favorites, and I, you know, you always really root for him to be making some sort of breakthrough. <laughs> right. And so we were able to just kind of like make a kinder, gentler Arkham, and like do some things that I think made it feel a little different than the normal comic book thing, where often like mental illness just gets shunted off and and said, okay, that's the bad guys thing. The bad guys are crazy. And yeah. That's as far as you get into it. The new Arkham in this movie, um, was that a holdover from the original Phil Barassa elements of the movie? Or was this a purpose, purposeful nod to the like continuity of you know Batman Beyond telling us that we have a new 
Arkham Asylum? Was that even considered or was it just kind of a... Return of the Joker is one of my favorite pieces. of It's probably, you know, Mask of the Phantasm and Return of the Joker Uh are my two favorite pieces. And then this one. (laughs) Very intentional that it was a literal new Arkham. I I don't know about the the, the backgrounds and models. Mm -hmm. Like it is possible that the, the background itself was drawn for a, a, a the Barassa story thing. Wise, I don't actually yeah. know, but story wise, it was the newer high tech institution to talk about in Return of the Joker. <laughs> See, this is the kind of stuff that we love having someone like you attached to the DCU is that you pay similar attention to this sort of stuff that we do. So it's like, oh, there's they actually did the new Arkham. Oh my God, <laughs> it's a real thing. Isn't even it? <laughs> even within the and look, I I don't even remotely claim to be. Uh, as knowledgeable about it as you guys, but even within that Return of the Joker movie, that particular flashback where Tim Drake gets turned uh-huh. and stuff is probably the piece of DC animated universe that I've watched the most. Would I oh, yeah. mm-hmm. turn that on? Just that clip constantly. Yeah, I used to come yeah. home from school and just watch that over and over again. Yeah, it's so good and it is terrifying. <laughs> yeah, it's but, terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> it is, I think, scarier that as much as this pushes the language. And like you see Superman bleed quite a bit. Uh-huh. And there are many fatalities in that movie because they are not called the non lethal five, as I have mentioned. <laughs> we were too. Um, yeah. As much yeah. as it gets dark, there is nothing in this movie that is as scary as yeah. Tim Drake laughing uncontrollably uh-huh. and the stabbings in that <laughs> and just the whole atmosphere of it. It's, it's crazy. It was there anything that you, oh, you know, there was a scene that was literally going to be in the movie but got deleted or something like that? There was a moment when they walk into the Hall of Justice League statues uh, and and there's a little joke about, you know, it doesn't look anything like me that Batman uh-huh. makes there. There was a longer version of that where they walk in and there's a statue of everybody except Batman. <laughs> and Jessica and Miss Martian are sort of like, like he, he doesn't remark on it and he sort of just slinks away and they come to him and they're like, you know, there's a lot of reasons that there might not be a statue of you. Like, because, you know, maybe you don't die. Maybe it's, um, you know, people will probably remember what you did. And it seems like Batman's been a little disappointed that he doesn't have a statue of himself uh-huh. in, this, in this gallery. And then at the end, when he fights Mono, there was supposed to be a moment where Mono is like, Superman and Wonder Woman, like, these are all legends where I come from. But I have no idea who you are. Uh-huh. Like, like. How does that feel like to be someone that nobody remembers? And Batman is basically just like, it's the only thing I've ever wanted. It's for ah. people to think I'm an urban legend and never be known and stick to the shadows and all of that stuff. And uh, if you don't know me, you can't, you don't know how to fight me. And that is when he sort of uh, does all the pressure points and takes Mono yeah, out. And so I that's like, like that a, bit a, of a <laughs> bit of a moment that, that got cut for, for time. Was there ever any. Uh discussion about maybe doing like a beyond era of the museum or anything like that like those justice league members no i think in the original version of the script we left it open it's a bit you know very hard at least for me to put into a script anything that's like bruce you should draw these are my favorite things and that you've drawn and you should draw those things because i like those character turnarounds jim and alan and i would kind of leave it open to bruce um and to sam i think the script would just say something like it's a hall with a bunch of statues of Justice League members. Right. Like, pick your favorite. It's a gallery with all of the Green Lanterns as holograms, but no specification of, like, which lanterns. Sure. And so I think if I had thought about it, I probably would have put in some of the Justice League Beyond stuff. But I think that, you know, it was easier just to be like, you are the animators, you are the artists. Sure. You <laughs> made this stuff with your hands you should get to choose who's on the pedestal. There's no Cairo in there, so it's not canon, obviously. Um, obviously not can canon yeah, yeah. without Cairo, who sure. is the coolest design. The coolest. <laughs> yes. yeah. We could have seen like a 40-year-old Cairo. A little like, Cairo. last airbender <laughs> yeah. kid, uh-huh. Green Lantern, is the best. Does the same go for the usage of Kilowog's Green Lantern the Animated Series model? Or did you do did you guys, including Bruce Tim, like kind of do that on purpose as like, hey, let's toss this in, why not? We got Kevin Michael Richardson and all that sort of stuff. You know, I don't know exactly whose decision it was. I would assume that'd be Jim, since Green Lantern, the animated series, Uh, is is his baby. But it also might have 
simply been Bruce, you might just honestly prefer that kilowatt design because I know it already changed once in the BCAU. Sure, yeah. I think they might just honestly think that's the better kilowatt uh, design. I kind of like it better. He definitely has like a tiny human body in Justice League with just a giant <laughs> hippo head. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I like it better. He feels too. more proportionate in this turnaround. So, I think that that was probably the decision yeah. there. He feels more like Kilowog in this version sure. to me. Uh, you guys should have just gone full bore and had him just be a Jimmy Neutron CGI model that just pops in <laughs> out of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> I see what you did there with full bore. <laughs> yes, thank you. Oh. <laughs> well, once the decision was made to have this movie in the DCAU style... Did you have any other things that you wish that you could have included that came to mind? Because it's like, oh, we're playing this in this universe I grew up with and everything that like might have happened after the fact, after it was written. There was a very tiny Wonder Bat moment in mm. one of the moments in the script, which was, I think, just in the climactic battle. There was a, a very obvious concern, like Batman got kind of injured in the fight and Wonder Woman was very concerned about him and came to his rescue. And it was one of those action movie things where it wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't sit down and declare their feelings for each other. There was no kiss on the cheek. There were no this little piggy moments. Yeah. It was just seeing that moment for the shippers, uh, of, of which, sure. you know, I'm one. Uh -huh. And yeah. <laughs> just having like a moment where you could see that these two people really care about each other and maybe even a little bit more than friends. That moment didn't end up making it. I kind of wish that had been in there. Uh, just, it's just a little taste. But I think, no, in general, I think we were so helped out by not knowing from the jump that this was DCAU yeah. mm -hmm. right away because it, it would have, I don't think I could have helped myself. Yeah. I think there were already so many ideas swimming around this thing that I think it would have been just a mess. The biggest thing already was chipping away at the marble to make the statue because I basically was like, here's the biggest chunk of marble you can imagine. It's gigantic and it's every idea I've ever had about the Justice League into, in one movie. Right. And everybody <laughs> had a character arc. Wonder Woman had a character arc. Batman had a bit of an arc that I was just telling you about. Mm -hmm. Superman had a whole thing about, you know, how he felt about the future and cynicism versus optimism. He went on this whole story with Mr. Terrific. There were a lot of stories that we, you know, we wanted everybody to have. And then the job is focusing in on your actual main characters, on Jessica and Starboy, and making those cuts. It's a big challenge with these ensemble pieces, but it's also what delivers the best movie. I was thinking about this the other day is that like Maddie and Ted and I, you know, we're watching and reading and enveloping the DCAU like every day of our lives. But there's people they haven't seen JLU since 2006 and they haven't, you know, watched anything. And so for this kind of, you know, comeback all of a sudden, you know, they want, oh, what's this guy up to? Is there Wonder Bat moments? Is all this stuff? I personally at least kind of just see the movie as like, oh, it's just, it's another, you know, three part episode or something like that that's just happens to be in this universe. It's not like it has to have all of these. It is better callbacks. that than nostalgia for nostalgia's sake. Exactly. Although yeah. we all, I think, want to reunite the, original seven sure. so all of this is very important mm -hmm. to me too but my actual favorite characters in the universe are green arrow black canary the question and huntress uh -huh. <laughs> and so <laughs> you know if if i were just picking favorites it would be like oh we got to get ken Triner as green arrow like right. that's the that's the voice in my head <laughs> i'm a big green arrow black canary fan we got to get Miranda backer in like that would have been the hardest battle for me if we had known ahead of time, there was actually a pitch on the table. This is all just sort of when we were just geeking out and the sky was the limit and we were blue mm -hmm. skying. Any idea was possible, trying to figure out who was going to be on the team and stuff. There was one pitch where Green Arrow and Black Canary would have been side characters. And at the end, there was going to be this crazy sequence where they were falling out of a plane. Truly, I told you we pitched like everything. Um, and the Legion ring was falling through the air and they had to get to the Legion ring so that they could fly. Uh, and at the bottom of it, after catching each other, Ollie landed with the ring in his hand and he proposed to Aww. Black Canary um, at the bottom. So like there was like That's really cool stuff idea. where it was just like, what is every Justice League idea you've ever had? Yeah. <laughs> Well, speaking of falling out of the javelin, there's a little tiny, like, two-second moment where you just see Batman spread his cape out and start gliding through the air, and it made me, like, I didn't, I watched the movie, like, four times before I watched it with my wife, and she's, like, pointing out, oh, because 
he can't fly in that one episode. So he fixed it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I never even realized that. I love it. So. I think, yeah, there's a, there's a couple upgrades, right? Wonder Woman has a sword now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, a couple of those. And Superman can breathe in space. <laughs> that's yeah, right. Apparently. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> when you had to move it to the DCAU continuity, like you said, you said you were already trying to write it to, to head Canada it in, but what was, what was like the biggest challenge of making things fit when you you started having to, you know, take stuff out of the script that was for the different style. Because it was more of a standalone, I don't know why I put that weird emphasis on standalone, <laughs> but uh, because it was more of a standalone movie, you know, we weren't having to undo a lot of, let's say, Tuckerverse New 52 ideas. It wasn't trying to really fit another continuity. One thing that Bruce has talked about is, you know, the voice acting. I think he mentioned this on the panel was that the Two-Face voice, for instance, Bruce ended up doing that right. so that it would sound a little bit more like Richard Mole, just to make the texture of it seem closer to what you had uh -huh. expected, right? Like Noel Fisher is not the guy who played Brainiac 5 in the cartoon, but he kind of sounds like Matt yeah, Dupree. Yeah, like yeah. there's like, there's a real effort to make the texture of it feel the same on the production side. You know, there there are the, the ones that are a little difficult to explain away, but they just, you know, that's the way we were telling the story. Sure. So there's the Miss Martian and stuff that we didn't worry about too much because we just figured, you know, people will go with it or not. So I think most of the actual plot stayed intact. And then there were just little moments where you just sort of erase contradictions you make sure it feels like the right two-face but it wasn't uh, it wasn't that big a, a battle except on the production side yeah because it sounds like the story was pretty much a hundred percent in place before that decision was made because like susan talked about she had she had recorded all of her lines and then came back to do adr and was oh it's it's this version i had no idea kind of a thing alan and jim were were, were doing stuff to, to act three that i think made things a little bit more consistent in like the final mm -hmm. fight and I think, you know, the, the Arkham stuff had to fit a little bit. I think, you know, there was a difference. We actually might have complicated one by, by putting this version of Bloodsport in early on. We had <laughs> sure. a, introduced a, a new character who was taking over the, the newsroom early uh -huh. in early drafts of this. And then it was switched to Bloodsport, which actually may have complicated the continuity more. But that was sort of uh, one of the places where that started to feel a little bit more like the Gotham of old. Um, and then, you know, Arkham was the, the big place where, where stuff had to fit. Who was it before Bloodsport? You have to tell us. <laughs> I, it, was a, it was a character that I imagined in my brain pan um, that I... I'm, I'm oh, it's like you literally made it up the character. Okay. <laughs> it, was, it, was not a new, it was not new to the DCAU. It was a, a, an entirely made up... <laughs> It was from your 2007 fan fiction, is what you're saying. Yeah. It more or less was. Um, and it, it was Red X. It would be nice to do at some yeah. point. <laughs> you know what? X, that would have been yeah. so cool. <laughs> holding up, holding up. It would have been Gotham really movies. complicated, yeah. especially since she turns into Robin. But you know. Well, do you have a favorite episode of Justice League or Justice League Unlimited besides Far From Home that you remember fondly? Double date, probably, now. Yeah, that <laughs> seems to be it. 100% yeah. double date. <laughs> nice. Uh, um, I love that episode. I really, oh boy, I'm forgetting the name of it. What it's a, it's a roulette. It's the, the roulette fight club episode. Oh, grudge match. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. one of them. Or uh, Canary. I, oh yeah, there were two. <laughs> yeah, there were two. Yeah. Uh, so Cat and Canary and both of them actually, yeah. the, du the, the duology of roulette episodes. Sure. I was so obsessed with those that I, uh, my very first episode of, Supergirl R is a R roulette. roulette. Uh -huh. I kind of figured that might have had something. To <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, and then you know what? It, it, like you, you have to say epilogue. That's the rule. Right. You have to say epilogue because <laughs> right. epilogue is the greatest. But you can't say what happens in epilogue. That's yeah. The other That's rule. The other you can't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've told us before that not only were you a DCAU fan, but you were a fan of the channel. So we're all kind of curious. What video was it that brought you in? And by chance, did any of it end up in front of Bruce Tim's face? <laughs> Bruce, uh, I don't know. I've never spoken to him about the channel. My brother, Robert, yeah. uh, has, you know, uh, dives into the stuff even deeper than I do. 
And so he kind of told me about it and he showed me, it was, it was relatively recent as far as how long the channel's been around. The yellow bat suit video is the one that usually brings people in for whatever reason, where I'm just freaking out Because about. it is a saga. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> when did you guys do Crisis on Two Earths? Is that a recent that one or is that last year? One? Maybe it was that. It was not, it was relatively recently, but then we got really into it. We were, it was actually, was the DCA you lock you or was it somebody else? <laughs> that, that was us. Yeah, that was that us. Was <laughs> 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 Yeah, we have literally used that this past Christmas. Oh. So, we are so know. sorry. And then we're very startled when talking about it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's a little out of the blue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah kind of scared, scared the crap out of us so when, when that happened. Because we had to turn it up pretty loud while we were, you know, like talking about other stuff um so yeah so, so that you know i still i still don't think yeah. i've even heard all the all the the bits and pieces that were in that we let it run you would think that if it something startles you a lot you would just be like what was that oh i'm turning this off but we were like oh, no, I'm, i don't know i want to hear this uh, so, a lot of inside jokes uh yeah so we, we did that one and you know we're always on there because when these started coming out stuff like crisis on two earths and or you know the the public enemies movie that they made as soon as you get a couple of these voice actors in okay yeah but why why do they have to go and make michael rosenbaum play barry allen because it was right. so close <laughs> to just yeah. being uh -huh. you know we would get into the nitty-gritty then and try to sort it out so then stumbling upon a channel that, that does that for you is a real resource, I think. <laughs> well, thanks. I guess, I guess we've got a couple more questions. Sure. With Fatal Five being a return to Justice League Unlimited, uh, do you think there's a possibility for maybe a Static Shock movie or a Batman Beyond movie or, you know, pulling back even further, maybe a, maybe a Freakazoid movie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zeta Project. Yes. yes. Uh, you know, yes. just... Now you're talking. Um, I we use the the company line of anything is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, this has kind of proven that because I would not have guessed that this was going to happen sure. uh, even just a couple of years ago. So more Justice League, but I think just more anything in this universe, I think does depend a little bit on this movie getting the love that we kind of all hope it does. Yeah, and so I think that would certainly help if this sold like gangbusters I, uh it, i don't know how is. complicated yeah. those numbers <laughs> I, 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 I has proof just yeah. had to leave best buy empty-handed because it was it sold was out, out. Yeah. at least the, the the oh i saw this on twitter yeah, yeah. 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 And I'm, I'm so happy that you're having this incredibly difficult time to find <laughs> i'm happy for you too maddie glad you didn't get a dvd <laughs> <laughs> that's one element of it obviously if this movie does well those things are more likely these movies are also slated and planned out well in advance as you know you know we started writing this over two years ago uh, and that's a pretty fast turnaround actually for animation so a lot of them are planned way out in advance uh, so we might be talking years from now although things can always get fast tracked the door is kind of open for anything that that fans want to see and that creators want to make and I know that there is a lot of love for this universe and all the pieces of it. So, you know, Batman Beyond and, uh, you know, those other shows, all, all possible, I guess. I, I am not the one making the, <laughs> yeah. the calls on, on what DC and Warners do next. Um, but I certainly would love to be a part of this universe uh, again. Um, and so if I ever get the chance, it's a little more likely. Um, sure. because that's that's where my head's always at. When we were talking to Alan Burnett, when we asked about Batman Beyond, he said, well, we're, you know, we're talking about him. And then he had to go retire, and we'll never know <laughs> if that was going to do anything. <laughs> in general, I love, I love the security of being Alan Burnett. So you really sure. can say anything. <laughs> yeah. Because everybody else, like me and Sam, are always out here doing interviews, like, can we say that? And looking over at Gary, uh -huh. and he's like, do we have permission to say any of this? And Alan could just say whatever, because he's, he's friggin' Alan. <laughs> right. um, particularly Bruce, but kind of everybody at, at the Warner's animation offices, they, they tend to believe in going forward instead of back. Uh, obviously, that didn't... Uh -huh mean we couldn't do this movie but it did mean that when we did it it was in a story that wasn't just okay here's the nostalgic reunion right, we're going right. to tick the boxes on what we think fans want to see we had yeah. to tell a new story a, a green lantern story and a star boy story and so if those things happen it will definitely be 
because there was a story that we felt couldn't be told another way, that there was a new thing to do in the Batman Beyond universe or a new thing to do in the Zeta Project uh, universe. Given the show an end would be a new thing to do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Uh, yeah, we gotta, gotta solve that for people. Some form of static, even if it's not the exact one that was on TV back in the day, should happen. There should be a static comic. There should be a static show. Yeah. There should be a live action static movie. He should be everywhere because static and the milestone universe is the best. Yes. I'm so glad that Young Justice did Icon and those characters. And yeah. I, think, you know, I think that's amazing. Um, I think that this movie might as well be a tribute to Dwayne McDuffie. And mm-hmm. I think that what he did on Justice League Unlimited is possibly the best superhero storytelling ever. And so you know, bring static, bring static uh, <laughs> yeah. back or yeah. do a new static, but static should be done. Bring them all. Well, is there anything else that you're working on right now that you can tell us about? Or um, do you know what happens in the Justice League reunion movie? <laughs> 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 I, uh, I have so the, the last super audio of that season, episode 21 of, of season four is me um and then i am doing some other stuff um in the comics world and and some movie stuff that i can't talk about yet and then there's uh, some projects that uh i'm doing with kevin smith that should be pretty cool Ooh, so nice. he, he directed a couple of my supergirl episodes yeah. and uh we've been talking about working on something together for a while so hopefully we'll we'll be getting into that uh now that he's wrapped Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Right. So he's, uh, yeah, you guys should make uh, Batman and Harley Quinn starring Kevin Conroy and Harley Quinn Smith. I think that would be a good movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's it. And, and then we will... will. I will pitch that to her on DC Daily when we do that. <laughs> and then we go. will argue how that's canon forever. A great time will be had by us. <laughs> so, so the question we're going to leave you on is a question from me that I'm making up right now. You, uh-huh. you said you had right. you said you head cannoned a lot of stuff in the DCAU. Explain head cannoning brainiac attacks to us. Uh, I got this. All right. So, <laughs> nice. Uh, nice. I have to admit uh, here before uh, DCAU Watchtower and God that I don't think I've ever seen brainiac attacks all the way through. I think I watched about 15 minutes of it. I don't think and I have either. No light on anybody involved with the movie. Boy, does it look wonderful on the cover of the DVD. I happen not to have seen much of the movie. Yeah, Maddie hadn't watched it until last year when we did a commentary on it. So if you do decide to watch it, you should watch it with our commentary. (laughs) Well, on that note, (laughs) I think think we've made it through everything we wanted to talk to you about. So, uh, you know, we really appreciate having you on today. I I, I know having someone like you really part of this, like for realsies, um, is sort of an inspiration to us. So we're in and to keep making this sort of content um, for, you know, that we started making for the fans and now we're making for everybody. Every, you know, yeah. every little piece of the, the puzzle. So um, thanks for being here. You are, you are all doing the Lord's work. <laughs> thank you. The, the, the great blue hand. Well, thank you. Yes, yes. the hand yeah. of the creator. It's been my honor to be here. I was really excited about this one. We've done a lot of <laughs> press and interviews for this, and I was uh, uh, very excited about this one. Uh, just because uh, this is the kind of the kind of stuff I was hoping for. It was the kind of discussion that you want, especially when you grow up <laughs> having these kinds of discussions. Right. So uh, don't at me, though. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't at me, people uh, who don't like the movie. If you don't like the movie, don't at me. If you like the movie, at me, and I will share it with all my mom, my friend, <laughs> brother. Do but it. it's okay to not like the movie. I like that too because that just means that like it's part of the it's out there in the world and uh, I'm so excited for people to see it. Well you flatter us and, and we're we're super happy to have you here today and maybe in the future we'll have you back and by maybe I mean definitely. It's fun guys. <laughs> yeah thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again and we'll we'll talk to you soon I'm sure. Of course cool. Talk soon guys. <laughs>